who simply cannot have spent any amount of time delving into the rich oceans of science fiction without coming across the name Robert A. Heinlein. Along with Isaac Asimov and Arthur C. Clarke, Heinlein is considered to be one of sci-fi's big three. Unlike Asimov and Clarke, Heinlein doesn't have a Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep or a 2001 A Space Odyssey. That is to say the kind of work that goes on to become a blockbuster movie and transcends science fiction and becomes a piece of pop culture. But that's not to say he wasn't just as influential. Heinlein was named as the first ever science fiction grandmaster by the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America in 1974. His novel Starship Troopers basically laid the blueprint for the space marine genre and even coined the term space marine. Uh, and he was also credited with coining the term speculative fiction, which is a term that is still used very widely today. Heinlein also holds the record for the most nominations in the Hugo Best Novel category and the most wins, with four of his novels picking up that distinct honor. Starship Troopers, Stranger in a Strange Land, The Moon is a Harsh Mistress, and the novel we're going to talk about today, his 1956 classic, Double Star. Double Star is the story of brilliant but out-of-work actor Lorenzo Smythe, who receives a mysterious offer from a spacefaring type called Dak Broadbent. The job will be to impersonate someone, though Broadbent doesn't specify who, and Lorenzo actually refuses at first because all protagonists must at first refuse their calling, but also because he considers impersonation to be a lesser form of his art. Eventually, though, Broadbent manipulates him by playing on his ego, and the pair of them jet off to Mars, to begin the job. Let's talk about Mars for a second. Whether it's H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds, Bradbury's The Martian Trilogy, Edgar Rice Burroughs' Barsoom Trilogy, or even Kim Stanley Robinson's Mars Trilogy, The Red Planet has always provided fertile ground for science fiction writers. Just close enough to home for it to be imaginable, but just far away enough that it could be strange and potentially wondrous. These days, of course, Mars is a sort of barren wasteland that we need to transform in order to enjoy. But back then, pre-moon landing America, Mars was full of Martians. And Martians could be whatever you wanted them to be. In Double Star, Martians are your classic alien race. Multiple limbs and pseudo-limbs, a strange look and a strange smell, and even stranger behaviours and customs, and, in this case, the centre of a debate between the government's opposing political forces. That's the Humanist Party, by the humans, for the humans, and the Expansionist Party, who believe that we must accept the Martians, welcome them into our civilization before we can move on and expand further into the universe. It conspires that the person that Broadbent and his crew want Lorenzo to imitate is leader of said expansionist party, John Bonfort himself. You see, John Bonfort has gone and gotten himself kidnapped just before his Martian adoption ceremony, the first union of its kind where Mr. Bonfort will be accepted as a Martian and bring the human race and the Martian race closer together. But there's a snag. Martian customs are strange and brutal and unforgiving, and a little thing like being kidnapped would not satisfy as an acceptable excuse for missing the ceremony. Uh, they would view Bonfort missing the ceremony as a grave insult, and the divide between human and Martian would be larger than ever. Enter Lorenzo, who must become John Bonfort, enter the ceremony in his place, and save the day for the expansionists. The novel is concerned about a few things, I think, it's concerned about xenophobia and about how fear of the strange can divide people and cultures in often destructive ways. I think it's also interested in political structures and perhaps the illusion of power, how we like to think that men uh, who are at the top of these structures are kind of men of, of control and of influence and of power, when in fact all they really are is parts in a larger machine that that was churning before they got there and will continue to churn long after they've left. But what I think it is interested in most of all is the unknowable multitudes that every person contains um, and what it could mean for someone to emulate that completely and without prejudice. What a role, Lorenzo says, as he finds out the true nature of the job and in spite of his hesitation, to play such a role in life, well, it's enough to make one understand how a man could go to the guillotine in another man's place. 
just for the chance to play, even for a few moments, the ultimately exacting role in order to create the supreme, the perfect work of art. The novel progresses with a kind of slow inevitability as Lorenzo gets more and more invested in the role and he starts not only looking and sounding like Von Fort, but thinking and feeling and acting like him as well. And as the people around him, even those who know the secret, start treating him like this man that they once knew. Uh, and as he starts making political decisions that Von Fort might have made with the real political authority that he held. And this, to me, is the heart of the issue. Lorenzo becomes Bonfort, and we're asked to consider if, in fact, he is Bonfort by the end. And indeed, what any of us are, but the roles that we play for the people that we meet. Man is not a single complexity. He is a different complexity to everyone that knows him. Out of the three Hugo Award-winning novels that I've read for this series so far, that would be this... Um, the Forever Machine and The Demolished Man. I do think this is the best out of the three. Uh, it's the most readable. It's got the best characters. And I think it's sort of the most modern in some of its ideas and what it's trying to say. It's still not very science fiction heavy, even though Heinlein is sort of considered one of the fathers of a harder sci-fi. In this, the character sort of mocks that several times, saying understanding the workings of a ship is not gentlemanly you know the martian stuff we're just asked to ex we're asked to accept that that is what it is like it, it none of that is explored or goes into very heavy detail um it's just all about this one guy's journey and that's absolutely fine it makes it really really readable and quite enjoyable i would say like if the novel was double the size and it is only very very short i think more stuff about the Martians and seeing the Martians and understanding their culture would have made the book's plot points and resolutions hit a bit harder. You know, the, the Martians just kind of become a convenient plot device and we're just sort of told at every opportunity, why this? Why not this? Why would this happen? You know, and, and the answer is always just because the Martians, you know, the Martians are just like that. I think that if we'd have seen that play out um, and... If we'd have seen Lorenzo, who you know has some prejudice towards Martians, if we'd have seen him interact with them in these sorts of ways, and we'd have seen these customs first, I do think everything could have been paid off a, a bit stronger, um, and it would have been regarded today maybe as more of a classic. But in any case, um, it's quite an enjoyable read, and I had a really good time with it. I burnt through it in like a day, uh, and I'd probably recommend it most out of the three. Next time on this series, we're going to talk about Fritz Leiber's The Big Time, which won the Hugo two years later after a year hiatus in 1958. And consider subscribing to this channel if you haven't already. I'm going to be uploading Monday, Wednesday, Friday, every week, every week this year. Um, and who knows what sort of content I'm going to put up. It's going to be about science fiction and about writing and about my writing journey. That's all I know. But I am thinking of ideas all the time and uh yeah if you're interested in joining me for that journey then hit the button and let's get on with it so uh yeah i'll see you on wednesday <laughs>